Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Today we will discuss disorders of the stomach, and in today's lecture we will discuss the physiological anatomy of the stomach and also acute gastritis and gastric ulceration. Gastric ulceration. We know that the stomach, which is a very important organ of the gastrointestinal tract for storing and for storing food and taking part in digestion is divided into different parts the cardia is the portion of the stomach where the esophagus enters into the stomach after it passes through the hiatus in the diaphragm the fundus is that portion of the stomach where mostly the food is stored the body of the stomach is that part where mixing of this food with gastric secretion uh, continues and also uh, digestion starts by uh, particularly uh, breaking down of the proteins into polypeptides which are later on broken down into amino acids to be used uh, for energy and other metabolic processes the stomach contains lot of rugae. By that we mean that when the stomach it is empty, it contracts to a smaller size, but when it is full of food, it can expand, expand uh, uh, up to a large size. The other uh, portion of the stomach known as the antrum, and here mainly uh, the stomach continues into the pyloric sphincter. Uh, which allows the passage of the food uh, into the duodenum, the first part of the gastrointestinal tract. Some portions of the stomach, they are very important. And in the epithelial lining of the stomach, uh, various cells are located in uh, gastric glands. Now, taking uh, to, into consideration the cross section of the stomach, so we know that the whole gastrointestinal tract is composed of layers. The innermost layer is the mucosal layer. The mucosa itself is divided into an epithelial lining and then lamina, pra lamina propria and it is surrounded by uh, muscularis mucosa. And this muscularis mucosa, uh, a thin layer of the smooth muscles, it should not be uh, confused with the muscularis externa. So, outside the epithelial layer, there is the submucosa which contains lymph node, blood vessel and is composed of connective tissue. The muscle layer as compared to other parts of the gastrointestinal tract, in the stomach there are three layers of muscles, smooth muscles. The innermost layer, which is mostly absent in other parts of the gastrointestinal tract, is composed of oblique muscle fibers. Then the circular muscle fibers and the outer layer is composed of longitudinal muscle fibers. So, after the muscular layer, the most outer layer known as the serosa is formed by the peritoneum and uh, it is uh, this serosa as we studied in esophagus, this is uh, this was known as the adventitia. So the stomach lies in the abdomen below the diaphragm, and the esophagus enters through the diaphragmatic hiatus to enter the stomach at the cardiac end. So going into uh, a little clinical anatomy, we can say that this is the lesser curvature of the stomach, and it is the most common of the common site for the gastric ulcer. The fibular cells are mucus secreting cells and they are mostly uh, located uh, in the fundus and they secrete mucus which gives protection to the gastric mucosa. The fundus and body of the stomach also contain the parietal cells that secrete hydrochloric acid uh, and the hydrochloric acid, as we know, that uh, it takes part in killing bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other toxins and chemicals uh, that enter the stomach. So they are 
destroyed by the hydrochloric acid and neutralized. And the hydrochloric acid also contains the fundus and the body also contains the cheap cells which secrete pepsin and which is pepsin is secreted in a precursor form known as pepsinogen by the cheap cells. But the HCLR hydrochloric acid secreted by the parietal cells, it will uh, convert a pepsinogen into pepsin and pepsin will take uh, its uh, important action in breaking down the proteins into polypeptides. And these polypeptides are further broken down into amino acids in the duodenum and small intestine. And the amino acids are then used by the body for energy and other metabolic uh, processes. So, the cardiac end, it contains mostly for your protection to the gastric mucosa. Now, coming to the antrum, the antrum of the stomach is the part that will lead to the pylor expanger to let the food pass into the first part of the duodenum. So, the antrum contains G cells. G cells mean they secrete gastrin. And here, I it is important to mention that gastrin is also secreted by the pancreas uh, and the uh, duodenum and the gastrin stimulate the parietal cells to increase the secretion of hydrochloric acid. So the pyloric sphincter normally it closes to keep the food staying in the stomach for proper mixing and for the uh, digestion to start. Now, through pyloric sphincter, the food enters into the first part of the duodenum, and the first part of the duodenum, which is between the pyloric sphincter and the sphincter of OD, the sphincter of OD opens into the intestine and it, and it consists of pancreatic duct and the bile duct. So, the region between the sphincter of OD and the pyloric sphincter, this part of the duodenum, it contains glands known as the Brunner's glands. And these Brunner glands are very important because they secrete uh, bicarbonate ions and this bicarbonate will neutralize the HCl reduced by the parietal cells and giving some sort of protection to the gastric mucosa and to the duodenal mucosa. Now, if you take a cross section of the stomach, so this is a diagrammatic representation of the stomach. So, the epithelial lining of the stomach, it consists of small grooves known as the gastric pits. And here we can see in this picture that the gastric glands, they are situated in these Pets. Now coming to examine a small uh, gastric gland, we can see that the upper portion which is close to the mucosa, this layer contains foveolar cells, goblet cells or mucus cells and they secrete mucus. And the epithelial cells, they are columnar epithelial cells. For example, in esophagus we discussed that the esop esophageal epithelium contains stratified squamous epithelial cells, but here the intestinal and gastric mucosa, it is made of columnar epithelial cells and they are secretory cells. So the cells at the upper portion of the gastric pit, it, they secrete the mucus and this mucus gives protection to the gastric mucosa. The cells down to the foveolar cells are mucus cells are the parietal cells or auxentic cells and these cells secretes hydrochloric acid and as well as a very important factor known as the intrinsic factor and this intrinsic factor is essential for the absorption of vitamin B12 and in some conditions for example in autoimmune gastritis uh, and some other conditions the intrinsic factor is absent. In autoimmune gastritis, the exantic cells are destroyed by the immune reaction. So, there is uh, 
no intrinsic factor and no absorption of vitamin B12 and automatically the patient will lead to pernicious anemia, a very important anemia. Now, below the parietal cells, there are the chief cells and the chief cells, they secrete a precursor of a proteolytic enzyme known as pepsin and this precursor is known as the pepsinogen and the hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid which is secreted by the parietal cells it will convert pepsinogen into pepsin and the pepsin as it is a proteolytic enzyme it will cause breakdown of the proteins into polypeptides and later on in the duodenum the polypeptides are further broken down by other enzymes into amino acids and the amino acids uh, are then used for metabolic purposes or energy in the body. Now, below the chief cells that secrete pepsinogen, there are specialized cells known as the G cells and these G cells, they secrete gastrin. Here I will mention that the gastrin is also secreted by the pancreas and the duodenum and this gastrin is very important because this gastrin will go through blood into the parietal cells and it will accelerate the secretion of hydrochloric acid. Below the G cells that secrete gastrin in a gastric pit down at the bottom we see enterochromaphene cells. These are also known as neuroendocrine cells. And these enterochromaphene cells, they secrete histamine. The secretion of gastrin by the G cell is promoted when the food enters into the stomach. The enterochromaphene cells they secrete histamine and histamine along with gastrin. Histamine along with gastrin, they are strong, positive uh, regulator of the HCL from the parietal cells. By that, what I mean, that together the gastrin and the histamine, which is secreted by the enterochromaphene or neuroendocrine cells, they will activate the parietal cells to increase secretion of hydrochloric acid. More down, there are cells known as the D cells and they secrete a growth factor known as the somatostatin. If you, if, if you recall, when we were studying the endocrine system, the pituitary gland which secrete the growth hormone. And you also know that the growth hormone will stimulate the production of the insulin-like growth factor. So this is also a part of the growth hormone system and this is known as the somatostatin. But this somatostatin which is secreted by the D cells located at the base of the gastric pits, it will have inhibitory effects. It will inhibit the production of uh, hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells and it also has uh, inhibitory effects uh, on many uh, glands throughout the gastrointestinal tract. Now coming to the acidity in the stomach, if we see our normal body pH is 7.3 to 7.4. By that we mean the blood is slightly alkaline because 7 is the cut point starting from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is acidic. And going above the 7, then this is alkaline. So the human blood is having a pH from 7.3 to 7.4. And by that we mean that it is slightly alkaline. But coming to the stomach, here the pH comes round about equal to 1. So you can imagine that how much harsh and acidic uh, 
will be the environment in the stomach. Here, I want to mention that the physiological production of hydrochloric acid, it has certain beneficial effects. And it benefits food digestion and by killing microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses, and other chemicals, this acid helps in limiting colonization by the microbes. But one thing very important that our stomach and our body itself, it is made of proteins mostly. So, since the gastric tissue or the stomach tissue is exposed to a highly acidic medium and this gastric acid, if the stomach is not properly protected by the protective mechanisms, this hydrochloric acid has the potential to damage the gastric epithelial lining, particularly when the acid penetrates the mucosal barrier. Here you see that first of all, here are located the foveolar cells that secrete mucus and this mucus then spreads all over here on the gastric mucosa and it doesn't allow HCL to directly enter into the mucosal columnar epithelial lining. So you know that the how much the protective mechanisms in the stomach are important and whenever by any reason if these protective mechanisms are compromised this acid has the potential to damage the gastric epithelial lining so let us see that what protective mechanisms are there in the stomach to protect the gastric mucosa from the damaging effects of the hydrochloric acid. As I said that the mucus secreted by the foveolar or mucus cells, it covers the mucosal wall of the stomach and does not allow hydrochloric acid or pepsin, pepsinogen to go into direct contact with the stomach wall. And also it protects the stomach wall from the direct abrasive effects the food particles that cause abrasions. So it also gives protection to the stomach wall by the solid contents or irritant contents or chemical contents in the food. As I said that the Brunner glands which are located between the pyloric sphincter and the sphincter of OD in the first part of the duodenum they secrete bicarbonate ions and these bicarbonate ions they will neutralize the hydrochloric acid. Here I want to mention that the stomach mucosa or the gastric mucosa is exposed persistently to highly acidic environment. Comparatively the duodenum or the small intestine, it is momentarily exposed to when food enters, when the acidic food from the stomach enters into the intestine. So for this reason, the gastric mucosa is more thick and strong than as when it is compared to the duodenal or small intestinal mucosa. The third component is that there is accelerated blood flow to the stomach as well as duodenum and the accelerated blood flow bring more bicarbonate ions into the stomach and these bicarbonate ions they will neutralize the hydrochloric acid and the hydrochloric acid also by the rapid venous drainage the acids are washed away from the stomach. The fourth component, if you remember when we were discussing inflammation and we discussed arachidonic acid metabolites. 
arachidonic acid metabolites they have got very um, prominent role in inflammation and we have discussed uh, in third year while discussing the inflammation that the arachidonic acid it is a um, uh, phospholipid located in the cell membrane phospholipids and the phospholipase break down arachidonic acid uh, the phospholipids into arachidonic acid and then the arachidonic acid is acted upon by two types of two enzymes cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase when the arachidonic acid is acted upon by the cyclooxygenase it will give rise to the productions of the prostaglandins are eicosanoids because of its contained 20 uh, carbon chain and by the lipooxygenase enzymes will convert arachidonic acid into lipoxins here we are concerned with the prostaglandins so the prostaglandins that are produced by the action of the cyclooxygenase enzyme on arachidonic acid and here we will talk particularly about the cox1 cyclooxygenase enzyme 1 there are two cox enzymes cox1 and cox2 cox2 is a little bit selective while cox1 is constitutely produced so by that i mean that cox2 enzyme is produced mainly during inflammations while cox1 production occurs also in normal physiological conditions so the cox1 enzyme it will cause the production of the prostaglandins and these prostaglandins are constitutively secreted in the stomach by that we mean that they are secreted normally not only during inflammation so these prostaglandins which are secreted in the stomach and duodenum they will stimulate the mucus and bicarbonate ion secretion and as you know the prostaglandin i2 pgi2 it is a strong vasodilator so by causing vasodilator in the nearby blood vessels they will increase the flow and circulation of the blood into the area and additionally the prostaglandins particularly the cyclooxygenase 1 or cox1 promotes the new epithelial cell growth and they inhibit the hydrochloric acid secretion so this is the very beneficial role of the prostaglandins in the body moreover the epithelial cells of the stomach they have got strong regenerative capacity by that we mean that the cells that are damaged they are lost and the epithelial cells start dividing proliferating and provide new cells that replaces the lost epithelial cells as i said that there is persistently harsh and acidic environment in the stomach so its mucosa is thick while the duodenum is uh, exposed to uh, uh, acidic uh, uh, food that enters into the duodenum through pyloric sphincter so it is momentarily exposed and comparatively the mucosa of the duodenum is less thick as compared to that of the stomach now coming to the disorders of the stomach for our convenience we divide the gastric disorders or the disorders of the stomach into two major types inflammatory disorders those that are associated with acute and chronic inflammation and the new plastic or proliferative disorders which are associated with the proliferation of cells in the inflammatory disorders the two most important disorders are the acute gastritis which in severe form may cause acute peptic ulcer peptic ulcer formation and 
the chronic gastritis. Acute gastritis may be mild or moderate and if, if, if it is more severe, it potentially it can cause peptic ulceration. By that we mean that the gastritis, the picture of inflammation in gastritis, it is converted into an ulcer when the underlying mucosa is sloughed up. So, gastritis may occur in its acute form or in its chronic form when the gastric mucosa is repeatedly and persistently exposed to some irritation. In the chronic gastritis, there are two types. One is the helicobacter pylori gastritis, which is also known as the peptic ulcer disease, and the other is the autoimmune gastritis, uh, in which the autoimmune destruction of the, uh, particularly the parietal or axiontic cells uh, occurs. Coming to the neoplastic disorders of the stomach, there are polyps, outgrowths of the gastric mucosa. Particularly important is the gastric adenocarcinoma, which is a very um, aggressive and lethal tumor. Lymphoma is the tumor that arises from the lymphoid organs. Carcinoid tumors, uh, they arise from the uh, neuroendocrine cells and secrete various types of factors. We will discuss that. And one important tumor that occurs in the stomach and which arises from the uh, stromal, from the stroma or mesenchymal tissue in the stomach, not from the parenchyma, but from the, mostly from the stroma or mesenchymal tissue in the stomach is known as the gast, gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Now, gastritis, gastritis, test and gast, inflammation of the stomach, particularly inflammation of the gastric mucosa. And we divide gastritis into acute gastritis and chronic gastritis. Acute gastritis is, it has got an acute nature and if it becomes severe and untreated and if the person is immunocompromised or if it is critically ill, so the acute gastritis will progress into acute gastric ulceration. The initial inflammation leads to ulcer formation. And once ulcer formation has occurred, it can lead to many complications. For example, it can lead to severe bleeding and hemorrhage. It can perforate. But this is the acute form of the gastritis. Components of the chronic gastritis are not seen in this picture of the acute gastritis. Now, the chronic gastritis, one of the more important situation that is associated with chronic gastritis is that the chronic gastritis carries a high risk for the development of the very lethal tumor of the columnar epithelial cells, the adenocarcinoma of the stomach. We divide chronic gastritis into the gastritis, which is caused by the bacteria Helicobacter pylori. And this, in its severe form, will lead to peptic ulcer. The same peptic ulcer can also be caused by the drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. The persistent use of NSAIDs like aspirin, brufen, and others, mostly in patients with chronic inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, and other muscular and osseous and other diseases which are associated with severe pain. These patients, they are exposed to chronic use of NSAIDs. And like H. pylori gastritis, the NSAIDs can also cause the formation of peptic ulcer. 
And here, one thing that we must remember that this type of peptoculture, which is mostly caused by the H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori bacteria, it is associated with increased secretion of hydrochloric acid by the parietal cells which are stimulated. So, peptic ulcer or H. pylori induced chronic gastritis is associated with excess secretion of the hydrochloric acid. On the other hand, the second type of chronic gastritis, which is known as the autoimmune gastritis. What happens that in autoimmune gastritis, our own immune system damages the parietal or axentic cells that normally secrete hydrochloric acid. And what will be the outcome that there will be a chlorhydria. A chlorhydria means decreased or very less secretion of the hydrochloric acids. So, in these two forms of the chronic gastritis, the peptic ulcer and autoimmune gastritis, one, the H. pyloric gastritis or peptic ulcer is associated with excess secretion of HCl, while the autoimmune gastritis there is less and sometimes no secretion of HCl. Additionally, we know that the parietal cells also secrete, in addition to the HCl, the intrinsic factor. And this intrinsic factor is very much important and essential for the absorption of vitamin B12 which is an important component of the red blood cell formation. So, when there is no intrinsic factor, there will be no vitamin B12 absorption. And what will happen? It will lead to pernicious anemia, which shows the characteristic picture of the red blood cells. Now, as uh, I mentioned that acute gastritis, it is uh, a timely, timely transient mucosal inflammatory process. Now, what will be the outcome? It depends on the severity of the gastritis. In mild to moderate gastritis, the patient may have no symptoms. And as we increase the severity of the irritating agent and the weakness of the protective mechanisms of the stomach, various symptoms can occur. The patient may suffer from epigastric pain. The patient may have nausea and sometimes vomiting. And in severe gastritis, What will happen that there will be mucosal erosion? The mucosa along with the necrotic debris is sloughed up, causing the formation of ulcer. And this ulcer, it can bleed. The patient in this situation can vomit blood in the form of hematemesis. But this will be the severe situation. Sometimes the blood is not vomited. Hematemesis doesn't occur or it is not so prominent, but the blood it goes to mix with the food and pass through the pyloric sphincter, small intestine, large intestine, and the red blood cells, they are digested and they give, give a black tarry color to the stool. This situation is the melena. And sometimes, but rarely, the severe gastritis leading to severe mucosal damage and ulceration and involvement of the blood vessels, there can be substantial blood loss.
either through hematemesis or through bleeding into the lumen of the GI tract. So, in this picture, we can see the, that normally the gastric mucosa it is protected against what? It is protected particularly against helicobacter, helicobacter pylori infection. The bacterial infection, they and the common cause of chronic spylori gastritis or peptic ulcer. The gastric mucosa is protected against the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like aspirin, brufen, protected against the uh, uh, damaging effects contained in the cigarette smoke, protected against the alcohol, protected against the gastric hyperacidity, and sometimes the duodenal gastric reflux. But as much as these protective mechanisms are competent, no problem will occur. But if the gastric mucosa is constantly or persistently exposed to these damaging forces, they will overwhelm the protective mechanisms. And sometimes if there is a problem, pre-existing problem in the protective mechanisms, so these injurious agents get a chance to damage the gastric mucosa. Some situations that are associated with severe stress like ischemia and shock, trauma, and also in patients where there is delayed gastric MTM, emptying, there is some problem in the pyloric sphincter and other host factors, for example, critically ill patients, patients suffering from other diseases. So what happens that in this situation, the protective mechanisms becomes weakened and the injurious agents, they overwhelm the protective mechanisms and cause damage to the gastric mucosa in the form of acute or chronic gastritis. If they are for once, they may cause acute gastritis. But if the gastric mucosa is repeatedly exposed to these injurious agents, and if they are persistently damaging the gastric mucosa, then it will lead to the formation of chronic gastritis. In chronic gastritis, in its severe form, may be, for example, spiluric gastritis or peptic ulcer. Now, in the third picture here, we can see the ulcer. And this is the severe form of inflammation of the gastric mucosa, severe form of gastritis. So, once an ulcer is formed, what happens that we can see at the base of the ulcer, acute inflammatory cells and necrotic debris. So, what are the acute inflammatory cells? Neutrophils, polymorphonuclear leukocytes. But here, deep to this layer of the acute inflammation, we may see chronic inflammatory cells and plasma cells, lymphocytes, and since the process of healing, fibrosis or scar formation, it is a component of the chronic inflammation. Scar formation, fibrosis, healing, it is not present in the picture of acute inflammation. When healing granulation tissue, scar formation, fibrosis, if it is present in a picture, this means that this type of inflammation is long-standing and it is chronic inflammation. So, in this picture, 
we you if you imagine we can see the acute inflammation after the normal gastric mucosa then acute inflammation chronic inflammation and also we can see the fib fibroblast and scar tissue more deep in the base of the ulcer now the causative agents for the acute gastritis are non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs aspirin brufen and so many other uh, over the counter drugs are available so what is their pathogenesis that they inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme cyclooxygenase enzyme and inhibit the formation of the prostaglandins number 1 one protective mechanism is lost moreover they inhibit the secretion of the bicarbonate ions that will neutralize the hydrochloric acid and the second protective mechanism is lost additionally alcohol itself has got a very damaging effect on the gastric mucosa and here one thing uh, important uh, that uh, in smaller forms of alcohol ingestion it will cause gastritis but heavy alcohol ingestion protects the gastric mucosa and it doesn't cause increased hcl secretion but remember it doesn't mean that we may take alcohol to protect our gastric mucosa because alcohol has got so many other very damaging effects but we don't know that why small amount of alcohol uh, increases hcl secretion but in large amounts it suppress uh, hcl secretion similarly radiation and chemotherapy that we commonly use for different types of cancers they can also damage the gastric epithelial mucosa and sometimes corrosive fluids in the form of acids or bases uh, that are uh, either taken accidentally or sometimes even for suicidal attempts they can also cause direct mucosal injury old age automatically in old age the fibular cells are mucus secreting goblet cells they become weakened there is less secretion of the mucus and less protection of the gastric mucosa so at the end what happens that the protective mechanisms they are overwhelmed are sometimes the damaging agent is not so powerful but there is some underlying inside defects in the protective mechanism whatsoever the situation will lead to inflammation of the gastric mucosa in the form of acute gastritis and a persistent it will lead to chronic gastritis now is acute gastritis if it is transient and if it is uh, of mild form the patient may develop no symptom and in moderate form the patient may develop epigastric pain nausea and vomiting and if it becomes more severe it will lead to complications and the more severe form of gastritis may cause either ulcer formation it will cause erosion of the gastric mucosa and the ulcer can bleed and the patient may vomit blood in the form of hematemesis and sometimes presence of blood in the food contents which passes through the rest of the gastrointestinal tract and give rise to the black tarry stools and the condition known as the melena and sometimes but it is rare there is there can be potentially so much excess blood loss in severe acute gastritis that we may need a blood transfusion for the patient now in case of 
transient gastritis or mild gastritis, there may be edema, which forms is in the from exudation of the fluid as occurs in uh, inflammation. There may be hyperemia, increased vascularity of the area, and sometimes uh, we may see hemorrhages. When the gastritis is severe, if it has eroded the gastric mucosa, and if the gastric erosion is bleeding or there is blood, we will call this condition as the acute hemorrhagic erosive gastritis. When the gastritis or the inflammation has eroded the gastric mucosa, and if it bleeds, if there are hemorrhages, we will call this situation as the acute hemorrhagic erosive gastritis. Histologically, neutrophils, normally the neutrophils, they are not present here. But in mild and transient form, or in a purely acute gastritis, we may see neutrophils above the basement membrane and in direct contact with the epithelial cells. In this picture, we can see grossly the hyperemic gastric mucosa and microscopically the surface epithelium and glands. But in mild type, they are intact and we will see as in any acute inflammation, we will see uh, polymicronuclear leukocytes. And the lamina propria on which the columnar epithelial cells are resting, it will be edematous. If today formation occur well here, and there will be uh, vasodilation of the blood vessels giving rise to vascular congestion. Now, as I said, that when acute gastritis becomes severe, it will give rise to acute gastric ulceration. Acute gastritis has the potential, if it is so very severe, it can cause the gastric ulceration, in which the uh, covering layer with necrotic debris is sloughed up, leaving behind a focal mucosal defect. So, acute gastric ulceration results from severe gastritis that erode the mucosa and deep up to the muscular layer. The mucosa and the lamina propria. So, under the microscope, these acute gastric ulcers, they appear as sharply demarcated multiple shallow ulcers. And in the base of these ulcers, the color at the base of uh, these ulcers appear brown and this is due to the presence of red blood cells that are digested by the hydrochloric acid. If the person is otherwise healthy, so here the most common or simple type of gastric ulceration will occur. And if we remove the cause, healing will occur with complete reepithelization because the gastric mucosal epithelial cells they have very strong ability to reepithelize to provide new cells and they are included in the labile cells if you remember we have discussed labile cells stable cells and permanent cells so these are the labile cells which proliferate throughout life and provide new cells to those that are lost. But sometimes this acute gastric ulceration, if it occurs, for example, in an immunocompromised or critically ill patient, which is a rare condition, it can cause severe mucosal injury. And in case of severe and complicated gastric ulcer, there can be bleeding and even it can involve the whole length of the gastric mucosa, transmural involvement. 
and it can lead to perforation with, with its catastrophic effects. Now, the mechanism of the NSAIDs, I have explained that the cyclooxygenase enzyme will lead to the uh, production of prostaglandins, particularly the COX-1 enzyme, and it increases bicarbonate secretion and permeability of the, uh, uh, sorry, increase uh, bicarbonate secretion as well as vascularity of the gastric mucosa. So these two are the very beneficial effects of the prostaglandins. But when we use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, what do they do? They will decrease, they will inhibit the cyclooxygenase enzyme and the gastric mucosa is deprived of the beneficial effects of the prostaglandins, particularly PGI2. Moreover, NSAIDs also has direct chemical irritation because they are chemicals. Here, uh, we will mention the three particular type of uh, ulcers associated with acute gastritis. Uh, number one, the stress ulcers, and these are commonly seen in shock, sepsis, and trauma. And this is a condition of severe stress. So, what happens that the underlying mechanisms are not very clearly understood, but the systemic acidosis, which lowers the intracellular pH of the gastric epithelial cells, and here hydrochloric acid is already present, and uh, the condition is uh, further amplified by the uh, hypoxia, loss of oxygen, and ischemia. So, the shock, sepsis, and trauma. In these patients, we can see the stress ulcers. The ulcers that are seen in these forms are severe stress. They are known as the stress ulcers. Sometimes, ulcers also occur in burns and, for example, road traffic incidents are other form of severe trauma. And those ulcers, they are also related to the circulatory uh, insufficiency by causing vasoconstriction in the splank neck circulation, the blood supply of the stomach, GIT, small and large intestine. So, number one, stress ulcers, they will occur in shock, septicemia and, and trauma. And the curling ulcers, particularly they occur in burns. And both of these conditions, the ulcer formation is associated with some abnormality of the vascular supply. Sometimes there is a third type known as the Cushing ulcers. And these Cushing ulcers are seen when there is uh, intracranial injury uh, that may occur due to many reasons and particularly even it may occur in neurosurgical procedures. Here, the mechanism is also not completely understood, but uh, it is said that what happens that in intracranial injury, uh, there is increased stimulation of the parasympathetic system or the vagal system. And we know that the vagal stimulation causes increased secretion of the hydrochloric acid. So, giving rise to the Cushing ulcers. So, stress ulcers, seen in shock, sepsis, and trauma, curling ulcers seen in burns, and cushing ulcers seen in intracranial injury. The gastric ulcer may be mild, moderate, severe, and accordingly it will cause symptoms. The treatment of the available strategies of treatment include the proton pump inhibitors, uh, omeprazole, isomeprazole, and so many ren, uh, rabiprazole, so many drugs are available, and also the H2 receptor antagonists. But here, the last thing that I want to mention, that the actual treatment is to cause, to remove the cause, to treat the cause, and to treat the underlying condition. Thank you very much.